Hello, and thanks for listening. This is Professor Ryan Paul. Uh, I'm going to be talking about loaded language, building on substance and not overtone, talking a little bit about that as a principle and what that means, what that doesn't mean, and then going over uh, some of the homework assignments, um, some of the problems in the homework assignment, diagnosing loaded language. One way to state the, the principle here is build on substance, not overtone. Um, and it's important, I think, that word build on substance. The idea here is that your argument, the core of your argument, should be concrete evidence. Things that you can demonstrate, things that you can support, ideas that are provable, measurable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The core of your argument should not be emotion, should not be um, anger, fear, things like that. The reason for that is because arguments that are based in emotion, because of the way our brains work, uh, we can be very easily persuaded by things that appeal to emotions that either make us feel good about ourselves or make us feel bad about other people that are different from us by uh, reinforcing uh, already existing beliefs, right? Things, arguments that are based in emotion, that are based in overtone, can often sway us even if there is no evidence present. Um, and I think there's no more uh, unfortunate example of this in the real world than the rise of racism or the, the sort of uh, recurrence of overt racism in American society that's going on today. Um, and in general, racism as a as an argument racism is an argument at, at its essence it's arguing that one group of people is superior to others is built entirely on emotion it's built entirely on overtone not on concrete evidence it's built on uh, pre-existing beliefs it's built upon fear um, it's built upon uh, uh, again overtone not substance does this mean that emotion has no place in an argument or in a debate, a discussion? Um, no, of course, there is a place for emotion, but it needs to be, at least in an ideal setting, if we're trying to uh, uh, engage in a discussion, a debate that advances the pursuit of truth, that comes to some sort of positive conclusion, then ideally emotion will be something that is not used to manipulate, right? that emotion is something that is there as inspiration, as motivation perhaps, um, as a rallying point, but not as something to manipulate people's uh, ideas, not as a way to trick, not as a substitute for evidence. In the exercise that we, uh, that I assigned, uh, you're looking for what's called loaded language. So the language is loaded, and um, that, that metaphor of loaded in a, in a couple different ways. Loaded as in full, as in full of something, loaded down with something. It's loaded full of all sorts of meanings that are not immediately apparent just from the word. And meaning, meanings, emotionally charged meanings, that may not be apparent to everyone, but only to certain members of the audience. In political terms, the, the slang term for this in, in politics is dog whistles. Certain terms that might appeal to uh, a group of your um, voters, uh, but that are not necessarily, that don't, that, that don't seem like they're coded, that don't seem to carry um, a secret emotion or, or a hidden emotion uh, to people that are outside of that group. So for example, the term states' rights is something that is often used as a cover for really uh, a, a kind of desire for um, older racial order in which um, African Americans are inferior, are, are second class citizens. That's often, so the term states' rights is often used as a sort of cover, as a dog whistle to appeal to people who their concern is not with federal, with the overreach of federal government, but their concern is over race and uh, maintaining the superiority of their own race. And language can be loaded, loaded in other ways. So, for example, um, we often hear the term, uh, you might hear someone describe illegal immigrants as infesting 
a country. Um, and that term infesting carries all sorts of emotional uh, emotions with it because we think of bugs, we think of insects. It makes us feel disgusted. It makes us think of swarms. It makes us think of disease and, and dirtiness and uncleanliness. And so it's loaded with all those meanings. And when it's used to describe immigrants, it's specifically used again uh, as a as a racist kind of term, as a racist uh, uh, charged term to make people um, fear and dislike immigrants. Right. So terms like infested um, words can be loaded with meaning like that. I think another reason why we call this loaded language is it's loaded in the way a gun is loaded. Right. It's a word that is prepared to go off. It's something that can explode in the right mind and can cause or maybe the wrong mind, so to speak. Um, it can it can explode in the in the uh, right person and make them take off on a certain course of action or become emotionally charged, irrational um, uh, uh, and sway them in a certain way. Uh, so it's it has a sort of violent explosive effect. Um, much like firing a gun. So it's loaded in that sense as well. It can go off. It's just waiting to go off, waiting for someone to pull the trigger, and then the emotional explosion occurs. And usually uh, someone is injured after that, right? So loaded language um, is often in that kind of negative, uh, using terms in a negative way. Uh, loaded language can also be in the form of euf euphemism. That is positive loaded language, language that disguises something that is negative. Uh, for example, by calling a, a uh, uh, concentration camp or calling something, calling it a re-education center. Or the example um, from the assignment says calling a, uh, a camp for holding prisoners of war a pacification center. Um, so sometimes euphemisms can be used to make things sound much nicer than they actually are. Right? And that's another form of loaded language. So loaded language here is language that um, tries to obscure reality or substitute for reality an emotional reaction. And it can be subtle in another way in terms of its context. Right? Again, the, the example uh, from the assignment points out that if you're in a political debate with someone and, or there's a political debate going on, one, one person says, uh, one candidate says, well, I didn't go to an Ivy League school like my opponent over there. Um, and the term Ivy League school is just a, it, it's not necessarily emotionally charged in one way or the other. Um, it's just a, uh, an accurate description for certain types of schools. It's what they're called. Um, but in that context, it seems like it's a charge of elitism, like it's a charge of snobbery, right? So certain terms can become emotionally charged, can become loaded, depending on how they're used, depending on the context. And this takes me to an important point that this idea about loaded language and really everything that we've been talking about regarding argumentation and logic, it's not just an academic exercise. It's not just about getting certain problems right. There is an ethical core here. This really is about ethics. That is about how we behave towards one another, uh, the way in which we organize ourselves as humans in a society and, and how we treat each other. Uh, if your goal is just to get people on your side, if your goal is to sway people, um, if your goal is to win, if your goal is to cause a violent uh, mob to, to attack a group of people, um, then loaded language is totally go ahead and use it. That's your ticket, right? Every fascist leader, every uh, dictator, every tyrant has in some way risen to power in, in part using loaded language. That is uh, using emotion, rallying people's fears and angers and hatreds rather than giving them concrete evidence rather than appealing to reason. Uh, and so implicit in this also is the idea that rational argumentation, logic, evaluating evidence, communicating with people in a neutral way, in a way that doesn't appeal to emotions, in a way that appeals to or that, that, that connects with another person's mind, um, that this is a way 
out of violence. This is a path away from violence. That's not to say that cold, calculating rationality cannot, uh, uh, as we know, can also lead to violence in, of its own sort. But essentially, the idea here is that you can't really, it's very hard to get uh, a mob to attack a group of people who are different, who look different from them, by only appealing to logic and evidence. Because that sort of hatred um, is always something that is based in, in, in lies, based in uh, fantasies, based in fears, and not based in logical, uh, rational evidence and behaviors. Now, this is not to say that um, logic and reason alone are sufficient to lead us to truth or are immune to um, manipulation themselves. Uh, in a certain sense, once you have implanted by emotion um, and fear, once you've implanted in someone, say, uh, a racist belief or fear of, of people who are different, um, then that becomes the premise on which someone's logic then then proceeds. So rationally, if member of X group is inferior or uh, are dangerous, and again, the person who has been um, uh, uh, taught to be racist or taught to be um, xenophobic is going to take that as evidence, is going to take that as reason, uh, as truth, then that becomes the basis for the logical uh, activity, the logical uh, conclusions that they then come to and, and how they structure their life and build their life. Well, then it's only logical to, for example, round up said group of people, or it's only logical to limit the rights of said group of people. Right, so once you have the bad premises, the bad evidence implanted by fear, hatred, uh, etc., then it just takes off on its own and it becomes the root of your logic. And so logic and reason ultimately are perverted to serve, uh, uh, to serve the, the violent behavior, the violent thoughts, the irrational um, overtones and, and, excuse me, the irrational uh, fears and hatreds that have been created initially just by appealing to emotions um, in order to manipulate. This can be uh, very complicated, though. This can be very difficult to uh, differentiate between um, what is evidence uh, and what is emotion, uh, demonstrate between, uh, to differentiate between what is really true out in the world and what someone feels or thinks to be true based on Again, perhaps the way they've been raised, perhaps um, what they've been taught uh, by their parents, by their friends, by their, by their community, etc. The assignment gives the example of uh, talking about doctors who perform abortions. Um, and it says, calling them using a phrase like baby killers to talk about doctors who perform abortions is something, is, is an emotionally charged term. It's something that uh, makes it sound like they are actively murdering um, children that are walking around, um, and many people, uh, uh, not, not just people who are pro-choice, but even people who uh, maybe are against abortion, still would differentiate between performing an abortion and killing babies. Um, however, let's say you are someone who is against abortion, um, and, and very passionately so, and you have been taught that that is what they're doing, that they are baby killers. What do you do? Um, how would you, if you're writing an article, what would you say? You would perhaps to yourself, you'd say, well, that is just what they are. That's not emotionally charged. That is um, the fact. Well, the first step, of course, would be to think about, well, what is my purpose and, and who am I talking to here? Is my purpose just to rally people to my side? Uh, is my purpose to inflame the passions of those people who already agree with me? Um, if so, then maybe that's the appropriate term. Um, I would argue with, with your ethics and your overall goals, but then using that as a term would be appropriate. But if your goal is to try to communicate with people outside of your community, outside of those who already agree with you, then maybe that's not the appropriate term to use, right? So the challenge then is to try to imagine the perspective um, give a good faith effort to imagining the perspective of someone who disagrees with you and not imputing to them 
only horrible evil motives, right? Um, I think especially in um, uh, uh, subjects that are as, as divisive uh, as currently as something like abortion is, um, it's very easy, and I, I think uh, certainly people who are anti-abortion, some at least, uh, impute very um, evil motivations to people who are pro-choice or people who perform abortions, even though those are not at all any the actual motivations or reasonings uh, reasons why those people are pro-choice or perform abortions. Um, so you, it's difficult sometimes to make that effort to say, well, the people on the other side are not evil. They just disagree with me on this subject. And I think then ultimately this, uh, as I said, this is about ethics. This is not just about writing a single paper or solving a, a particular homework assignment. Um, thinking about the language that you use and what are the ways that, that, uh, that you talk about that you conceive of, of a certain problem, of people who are different from you, of people who are like you, causes you to look at what, what really are your beliefs and what are your goals. As I've said before, is the goal to win? Is the goal to beat the other person? Is the goal to be right? Or is the goal to make some improvement in the world, to solve some problem? For example, in the case of uh, abortion, from my perspective, what I've read, what I've researched and studied on the subject, I would argue that the solution, the way to reduce abortions, is not to attack women who have abortions or to make it more difficult for women to have abortions, but to remove the situations that cause women to want to, to, want to have an abortion in the first place. That is, uh, for example, improving sexual education. So people are more knowledgeable about safe sex practices, uh, about the consequences of sex, etc. To improve access to um, condoms and other forms of prophylactics, improving the economic prospects uh, for young people and young families so that having a child is not a, an immense financial burden. Uh, so there's all sorts of other ways that I would argue if you want to um, solve the problem of abortion, uh, reduce the number of abortions, uh, and hopefully eliminate it eventually, because I think that's something that everyone would, would agree is, is an ultimate goal, that, that there are no more abortions, I would argue the way to do that is to attack the causes of abortion, not necessarily the people who are getting abortions um, or who are performing it. Uh, that's like putting a Band-Aid on a cancer. So reflecting on the language that other people use, reflecting on the language that you use to communicate with other people is a way not only to improve your communication, improve your ability to tell other people what you think in such a way that will be um, amenable to them in such a way that they will accept, that they will hear. Um, and it's also a way, I think, to evaluate and to uh, consider your own beliefs and whether they are built on evidence, whether they are built on things that you can be confident in, um, or if they're built on emotions, on uh, vague fears, on just beliefs that have no true uh, concrete core but are just there because for what, in some way or the other, they make you feel good or they reinforce your sense of self. All right. Uh, with that in mind, let's turn to the exercises. Let's look at number one. Um, so if you've got the homework assignment, build on substance, not overtone, diagnosing loaded language. Um, if you have that available, please take a look at it. The first one, religious fanatics lost the battle on anti-gay discrimination in the military. This isn't the end of their dangerous influence, though. Now that they've seen that their hate-mongering against homosexuals isn't going to win elections, they may just step up their fear-mongering against other groups. So there's some pretty obvious uh, loaded language here. Fanatics, calling them religious fanatics, um, which is uh, assuming, charging them with being unthinking, uh, dogmatic followers who... Um, uh, are you know violent in their pursuit and their single-minded pursuit of um, their imposing their religion on others? Um, dangerous influence, right? That that their that their influence on politics is dangerous. That they are dangerous, and of course the terms hate mongering and fear mongering to describe their actions. Um, and 
the reason why this is problematic is, of course, there's no evidence. We don't know who the people are. We don't know what exactly they've said, right? So these are all very charged terms to describe um, activities uh, and, and people that we don't really um, – that puts a sort of blanket negative emotional uh, uh, overtone on them, uh, connotation on them, without telling us who they actually are or what they're actually doing. Now, um, I'd like to, to make a point here. Um, does this mean that you can never call something that someone's doing uh, an act of hate mongering, that you can never say that some activity or some group or, or person is dangerous, that it's always going to be um, uh, just a kind of emotional manipulation? Uh, no. Let's take, uh, especially now with, with the rise in the United States in the recent years of white supremacist groups, neo-Nazi groups, um, it is uh, anti-Semitic groups, all sorts of other things. It is not, um, I think, it is not loaded, it is not incorrect to talk about the Ku, Ku Klux Klan as a hate group. That is what they are. They are uh, based on a philosophy of racial exclusion um, and a belief in the superiority of a single race and the inferiority and criminality of all other races. So I don't think it would be incorrect to call the KKK a hate group, um, nor would it be incorrect to call, uh, for example, the members of Al-Qaeda religious fanatics um, in some sense, right? Uh, what they are doing is, you know, in terms of their beliefs or, or religious fundamentalists, right? That would not necessarily be um, a negative, uh, that, would, that wouldn't be an incorrect way to describe them or to describe them as dangerous, right? They, they're a violent uh, military uh, organization. So, of course, they are dangerous, right? So, here, again, it's, it's about, in some sense, it's about being truthful, about being honest, and, again, having the evidence to back up what you say. There's a difference between saying, I think soldiers would be more comfortable if homosexual soldiers kept their sexuality secret. And so I think we should institute don't ask, don't tell. Let's say that's what someone says. That's one sort of statement. It's a completely different statement to say, I think all homosexual people should be killed. Um, those are two different statements. I would argue that there is a, 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 a thread connecting them. There is a spectrum. And because really, ultimately, if you say I would be more comfortable if I didn't know that there were homosexuals around me, it's sort of like saying you wish homosexuals didn't exist. Um, but still, those are different statements. And saying I think we should kill all homosexuals is definitely hate mongering. Whereas saying I think m more people would be comfortable if they were uh, if homosexuals kept their sexuality under wraps, that is not explicit hate mongering in the same way. So it's about measurement. It's about um, ca characterizing things and actually looking at things. Um, and evaluating the level of, um, in this case, the level of their rhetoric, the level of violence, the level of actual hatred and emotion that these other people might have been um, expressing. So what might be better ways to phrase this? Well, again, religious fanatics makes them sound very um, radical and negative, uh, maybe religious groups. And, of course, we don't even necessarily know if all of the uh, these people were religious, so maybe just supporters of don't ask, don't tell, um, if that's what this is, uh, since that's what this is, this is in reference to. Um, so supporters of don't ask, don't tell lost the political battle over homosexuals in the military. Um, you could just cut phrases like dangerous influence, right? Um, instead of hate mongering could be, Opposition to homosexuals, uh, um, opposition to homosexuality in the military, opposition to open homosexuality, right? Something that's, um, again, less emotionally charged, less explicitly negative. But overall, so overall, this is a fairly simple, simple uh, example. Let's look at number two. Again, very simple. Of course, I'm going to beat Henry Cooper. He's nothing. He's a tramp. He's a bum. I'll knock him out in five rounds. No, three. And this is Muhammad Ali, the famous boxer, talking about um, uh, trash-talking his opponent. 
Um, and it's pretty obvious, again, with loaded languages. All the things he says about Henry Cooper. He's nothing. He's a tramp. He's a bum. These are all ways to denigrate, to insult Henry Cooper. Uh, and they're emotional, right? They're, they're insults. They're not saying, well, Henry Cooper is uh, not as fast as I am. He is an unskilled boxer. Henry Cooper is uh, inexperienced, et cetera, et cetera. Those would all be less emotionally charged ways. They wouldn't be insults. And, of course, they wouldn't be as much fun, though. Um, I would argue that the first and last sentences are also subtle examples of loaded language. Of course I'm going to beat Henry Cooper. When you say, of course, the implication is, is almost, why would you even ask? Um, it's obvious that everyone knows that I'm going to beat Henry Cooper. And then I'll knock him out in five rounds. No, three. Uh, there's, a, there's an air of arrogance there, of, of bragging, right? Uh, yeah, I can knock him out in five rounds. No, you know what? I can do it even quicker than that in three rounds. Uh, so that act of revising himself is also a subtle example of loaded language. All of this with the effect of denigrating, insulting Henry Cooper, making him seem uh, like nothing compared to the great and powerful Ali. And because this is trash talk in sports, this is trash talk in boxing, uh, improving it really wouldn't be an improvement. That is, removing the, di the loaded language wouldn't improve it. It would make it a whole lot less fun, uh, although it might make it somewhat amusing. Okay, let's go to number three. The dirty little secret behind factory farms' profits, namely that there's no good reason for their monstrously cruel mistreatment of animals, is getting out. Since morally decent people abhor senseless animal cruelty, people everywhere are turning against factory farms. So, fairly obvious what the um, negatively charged language is. Dirty little secret. No good reason. Monstrously cruel mistreatment. Moral. E so those are all, uh, or senseless animal cruelty. Um, those are all... Uh, very negative terms to describe what the factory farms are doing. Now, the issue here, I think, is not so much on whether or not what the factory farms are doing is or isn't morally justifiable. The problem is with the way this person is making their argument to try to convince you that what they're doing is not morally justifiable. They are not allowing you to make the decision for yourself. They're saying the treatment is monstrously cruel. But what is the actual treatment? A more effective argument, even though it wouldn't be quite as uh, satisfying and self-righteous to make, would be just to objectively describe this, the conditions in the factory farms, the sizes of the chicken crates, the way uh, the cows are slaughtered, the way cows are milked and impregnated, um, et cetera, et cetera. By simply describing objectively the conditions, I think this argument would go a lot further towards convincing people, including people who might be predisposed to disagree with them, that the activities of the factory farms are um, unethical, immoral. So they don't let you make the decision for yourself. And that can be something that is, uh, the problem here again, is not that um, the people that agree with you already aren't going to agree with you. The problem is that it's going to turn off people who are not already predisposed to agree with you. People who either disagree or people who just don't know anything about the subject. If you don't allow them to make the decision themselves, they're likely to either reject your standpoint or only uh, be easily swayed from one side to another. Another subtle example of loaded language here is the phrase morally decent people. Right, the saying, since morally decent people abhor senseless animal cruelty, people everywhere are turning against factory farms. The implication there is uh, sort of like the, of course I'm going to beat Henry Cooper. How could you even ask? Um, morally decent people abhor this, so if you don't abhor it, are you, you must be morally uh, indecent. You must be immoral. So it's a kind of subtle peer pressure. It's a kind of imp uh, a pr a manipulation by implication. If you think you're, if you're a good person, then you'll do this, right? Rather than, again, letting people decide for themselves what they think is right or wrong based on facts, based on knowledge, based on concrete evidence. So how could we improve this one? Well, rather than saying the dirty secret for their monstrously cruel mistreatment, et cetera, et cetera, just something as simple as more people are learning about factory farms 
uh, procedures, the, the, the way factory farms treat animals, such as, and then describing objectively the uh, details of those conditions and their treatment. Because of this treatment, because animals are treated in this way, many people are turning against factory farms. A much more neutral, objective way to put it, and it again allows the reader to decide for themselves what side they're on, what they think about this uh, situation, and they have evidence to base that decision on. They have some something to use to make that decision. Okay, number four. If you're trying to lose weight, it's important that you not skip meals. If you skip meals, you're likely to experience hunger and food cravings later, making it harder for you to stick to your diet. Instead of skipping meals to control your calorie intake, eat appropriately sized meals on a regular basis. If you said there's no loaded language, you got it correct. There's nothing here that's emotionally charged. There's nothing here that's, that's either uh, uh, negative, positive, uh, one way or the other. It's just a fairly neutral um, and clear description of an important thing to keep in mind when trying to lose weight. So, uh, number five. We can all agree that the defendant bought the murder weapon earlier that night. The pawn shop owner saw him buy it, and his friends saw him carrying it. So how does that switchblade end up in the old man's chest if the boy didn't kill him? Remember that imaginative little fable that the boy told? He claims that the knife fell through a hole in his pocket on his way to the movie theater. You don't really believe that, do you? The boy's a murderer, plain and simple. So here, subtle manipulation rather than outright explicit negative words so there's nothing like hate mongering doesn't say the boy is a psychopath anything like that right very subtle forms of loaded language how does the prosecuting attorney here describe the um the boy's alibi the boy's testimony he calls it an imaginative little fable right so by using that term to describe it tries to rob it of its credibility that story, that made-up uh, fantasy fairy tale that he told. Such a great product of imagination, not reality. Right? So that's a subtle way for the prosecuting attorney, attorney to rob the story of credibility, to undermine its credibility. And then, after he says what the story was, he says, you don't really believe that, do you? Again, much like the, of course I'm going to believe Henry Cooper. Right? You don't really believe that, do you? has the suggestion of, you're too smart to believe that, right? You're not a dummy, are you? Only an idiot would believe a story like that, and you're not an idiot, are you? Uh, so those subtle ways to encourage people, almost by, by a form of peer pressure, to respond saying, oh, no, yes, you're right, I, I, I'm not a dummy, of course I don't fall for that, right? Um, and you may think, well, isn't that silly? Wouldn't, wouldn't, are, are people really that... Uh, uh, simple-minded? Yes, people are. Um, think to your own life, how many times have you pretended to get something, pretended to agree with something, pretended to understand something because you didn't want to look dumb to the people around you? Um, it's very, very common. It's something that people do all the time. So here, the prosecuting attorney taking advantage of that, trying to manipulate the jury into siding with him because if you believe what the boy says, you must be a dummy. Moving on to number six from another movie about a courthouse, another trial movie, law movie. Seriously, you're going to try to murder a sweet, gentle, leaf-eating, doe-eyed deer, and you're worried about what kind of pants you're going to wear? Imagine you're a deer. You're prancing around the forest. You're thirsty, so you stop at a clear, gently gurgling stream to take a nice, refreshing drink, and bam, a bullet blows your head wide open, splattering bloody bits of brain all over the place. Now let me ask you, are you going to care what kind of pants the jerk who shot you is wearing? No, it doesn't what matter what kind of pants you wear. Incidentally, Marissa Tomei, the actress who uh, gives this speech, won an Oscar for her performance in this film. She was good. It's a good movie. I don't know if she deserved an Oscar for it. Kudos to her. Anyways, um, Again, the, the loaded language here, pretty obvious. Uh, and there's both positive and negative loaded language. On the one hand, talking about hunting, in this case, as murder, right? Uh, people who are hunters, and even people who aren't hunters, many of them would, would uh, reject the idea that hunting is murder. Um, it might be killing a living thing, 
but it's different from murder. That's a specific type of crime. That's a specific type of violence um, that comes from hatred, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very different from hunting. And then talking about the person who's doing it as a jerk. So just assuming that the person who killed the, the deer is a jerk rather than just a person. Um, so insulting uh, and insulting, obviously, her audience here, calling him a jerk because he's about to go hunting. Um, if you do this, you're a jerk. If you kill a deer, you're a jerk. That's what the implication is. And then also describing the bullet wound in graphic detail, bloody bits of brains um, as a way to gross out the audience, uh, her, her, her listener here, or as a way to heighten their sense of disgust, to emphasize the violence of the activity. Um, that's also a form of em emotional manipulation. And then on the other hand, we have sweet, gentle, leaf-eating, doe-eyed deer prancing around you drink at a clear, gently gurgling stream to take a nice, refreshing drink. So all that positive language to make the scene and to make the deer uh, seem uh, like this beautiful, idyllic moment, this, this uh, heavenly, Edenic kind of scene out in the forest. It's all beautiful and perfect. She's like Bambi or Bambi's mom, rather. So it's the counterpart to the negative description of the hunter and his action is the positive description of the deer. Uh, how could this be improved? That is, how could you, what would you do if you wanted to remove the loaded language? Well, it would be a rather boring scene in the movie, and it wouldn't be all that entertaining. But if you are, imagine that you're a deer. Um, you are walking in the forest. You st you're thirsty and stop to drink at a at extreme, a bullet pierces your head and you die, are you going to care about the pants that the hunter who shot you was wearing? You know, something like that. That's a very boring speech, though. That's not going to be very entertaining in the movie. So, um, you know, sometimes loaded language is more fun. All right, number seven. Instead of boring you with the details of the new and innovative accomplishments that, I've in that I intend to achieve while I have the honor and privilege of serving as your class president, let me just say that when you vote for me, you won't just be voting for Tracy Flick. You'll be voting to make this school a better place for you, for me, and for all of our other wonderful classmates. That's why you should vote for me as your next student body president. And this is a speech by Reese Witherspoon in Election, a very, very funny movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Uh, this is all positive loaded language intended to make her seem like a likable, good, hardworking, uh, positive candidate for school president. But what does she actually say? Does she actually say that she's going to do anything? Well, she says new and innovative accomplishments without listing what any of those accomplishments are. Make this school a better place for you, for me, and for all of our other wonderful classmates. How is she going to do that? Right? No specifics. Uh, even though this is a high school student making a speech to become class president, we might think about how many politicians just say empty things. I'm going to make... Uh, America work. I'm going to put people to work. I'm going to make it better for you and me, right? All these statements, there's one that I'm not saying, obviously, uh, that people, that politicians say that are really just empty slogans that are used to get people excited, rally people, get them on their side because it sounds good, leaving the specifics for later. The other thing that uh, the speaker does here is flatter the audience. I have the honor and privilege of serving as your class president and your wonderful classmates, right? So complimenting her audience, you're real Americans, you're great people, you're good, hardworking people, you're salt of the earth, in order to say, oh, well, this person likes me, I must like them too. Uh, flattery as a way to manipulate, to sway the person, uh, to sway the audience, make them think she's one of us, we're, we're all on the same side. Um, again, how would this be changed if you wanted to remove the, the loaded language? Primarily just by actually giving details of what she would do. What are the specific plans that she would plan uh, that, she's, that she has for improving the school? And how are these things actually going to, how are her, her accomplishments that she plans, how are they actually going to make things better? And finally, number eight. 
Some members of Congress don't want to raise the federal debt ceiling. They need to understand what, this would, what that would mean for the economy. It would mean a bigger economic crisis than we saw in 2008. It would lead the U.S. government to default on its financial obligations, the first default anywhere to be caused purely by insanity. So what's the loaded language here? It's just that last phrase, the default to be caused purely by insanity. And why is that the only loaded language? Well, everything else is it's factual, essentially. It's saying some members of Congress don't want to raise the federal debt ceiling. That's what, they, that's what some members of Congress uh, want to do or don't want to do. And then saying they need to understand what that would mean for the economy. Some people uh, identified that phrase need to understand as loaded um, because it seems insistent. It's saying I need you to understand this. This is something you have to do. But I don't think that that's emotionally charged or it's, it's not emotionally charged. It's even though it is insistent, it's saying something is important. So this is not about, you know, loaded language is not about just being uh, emotionless in the sense of not, not judging one thing as important, viewing everything as equally important or something like that. It's saying this is important, but it doesn't say these idiots need to learn uh, the basics about economic policy or something like that. It just says they need to understand. It's important that they understand what this would mean for the economy. Um, it would mean a bigger economic crisis. That's maybe true, maybe not, but it's not emotionally charged. It would lead the U.S. government to default on its financial obligations. Again, maybe that's what this would, would cause, uh, but it's uh, maybe it's not what it caused, but this isn't emotionally charged in any way. It's just the person saying this is what I think will happen if we do not raise the federal debt ceiling. Um, it's saying that their reasons for doing it are insanity, imputing to them the idea that there's no good reason someone could have to not want to raise the federal debt ceiling. The only reason one could have for doing that is if you are insane. And I, I hope you've seen a sort of common theme here in a lot of these. The author doesn't allow the audience to make their own decision, doesn't give them the information to make their own decision. The, uh, the author makes the decision for them. And to go back to the, the issue of ethics that I was talking about earlier and how thinking about the language that you use is not only thinking about the argument you're making for someone else to read, but thinking about your own thought process and your own beliefs. When you give people evidence, when you give people rational argumentation, you're giving them the tools that they need, the information they need to think through a problem and make a decision. And you hope that the evidence that you've given them and the, the argumentation that you've given them, the reasoning is strong enough that they will make the same decision as you have. And what you're also doing is you are showing them how you came to your thought process. Uh, or uh, you're showing them your thought process of how you came to your conclusion, of how you came to your assertion, whatever it is you're trying to prove. So you're not just, that, that's why it's um, not just for the other person, it's also for yourself. If you discover that the only way you can make an argument for some course of action or against some course of action or for some idea, whatever, if the only thing that you can say to support it is emotion, is emotional manipulation, overtone, rather than actual evidence and reasoning, then that exposes, that exposes something about your own belief, that that's a belief uh, that is maybe, that you maybe need to reevaluate, that you need to reconsider. Not necessarily change, but at least think about and say, why do I believe this? Is it just because I think I have all these emotions that, that come up when I um, think about people who are of a different religion than me or if I think about a certain political issue or whatever it might be. If the only thing that, that you have behind it is emotion, then you need to investigate that subject a little bit more and really look at the evidence and decide if your beliefs coincide with the evidence that's out there. If once you've thought through the evidence, if you still think the same way as you did before. So uh, with that in mind, I will end this presentation on diagnosing loaded language. If you have any questions, please get in touch via email. 
Uh, otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next presentation.